So hello and welcome uh, with this podcast that we are doing at Stake Peace Projects. Um, we are speaking, as you know, with all sorts of people all around the world about peace and mainly about the question, how will peace return to Ukraine? And today I'm very glad and honored to um, be able to speak to Larry Johnson. Uh, Larry is a former, former analyst of the CIA and uh, worked at the U.S. State Department on the Counterterrorism Department. And he is one of the most outstanding analysts, I think, uh, of the current war. Uh, so I'm uh, very honored that you are here, uh, Larry. Can you maybe uh, you. tell the audience a little bit, uh, a little bit more? I just gave you some uh, some details, but a little bit more about your background. And sure, yeah, uh, I, I was with the Central Intelligence Agency for four years. Uh, my first year was spent as a sort of as an intern. Uh, I got to work on a variety of projects from the war in uh, Afghanistan at that point, which was the United States was supporting Mujahideen fighting against the Soviets. Uh, then the Central American Task Force, which involved the war in Central America. So I worked on the operation side, that, but wound up on the uh, analytical side of the house and did, did that for three years. I left in 1989, went to state in the Office of Counterterrorism, uh, at, and uh, my job there was I oversaw international training, uh, anti-terrorism assistance training, transportation security, and worked with military special operations. Did that for four years, and then uh, over really the last 25 years, uh, I was providing uh, exercise support to the U.S. Military Special Operations Command. So I work closely with uh, the, the, the all the, the the military units that always make uh, movies about, you know, the top secret units. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, I was involved with uh, financial investigations in my consulting business. Mm -hmm. So uh, been around the world. Been around the world, exactly. And I started my introduction by saying that I'm interviewing people around the world who are each in their own way sort of promoting peace. I don't know if you would describe yourself like that, but I've I've noticed actually that um, uh, during this conflict, the the analysts, the people who are actually capable of of um, seeing and understanding what's happening on the battlefield, mm -hmm. um, they actually contribute a lot <clears throat> to peace because they can they can actually tell whether where a war is going, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and, you know, part, part of the problem we have, Jacob, is that. Uh, the United States, the way our government is currently structured in terms of uh, getting money to fund the government, it is a built-in incentive to continue to look for wars overseas because those wars are a source of justification for expanded spending on the Defense Department and uh, it's almost as if the United States needs wars in order to keep the economy going. I mean, it's sick. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's uh, it's disgusting. And when you look back over uh, the history of the United States over the last you know 30 years, 40 years, um, we hear the criticism that Russia is an imperial power, that Russia is trying to move out and conquer other countries. Yet, when you look at Russia's involvement in military operations outside of its uh, immediate boundaries, it's only been involved in about five, uh, maybe four. Uh, and those are all on its border. You don't have a single instance in the last, since, since Russia emerged from the Soviet Union in 1991, we don't have a single example or instance in which Russia has inserted its forces militarily, <coughs> excuse me, in another country against that country as well. Hmm. Not one. Whereas the United States has done that over 200 times in that time frame. Incredible. So who, who's the imperial power? Hmm. You know, who's the one that's out stirring up conflict? And so it's just, uh, I like to deal with the facts. Yeah. This is, should not be about emotion. It should be about facts. 
Well, it's very interesting that you say that because um, uh, as an organization, we also talk to politicians here in the Netherlands, the politicians who do support sort of um, the current direction with NATO and those who do who, who oppose it. But there seems to be an agreement between both that uh, saying, okay, um, well, let, let me say just also the ones, there are very few of, uh, politicians that oppose the current level of, of uh, military support to Ukraine. But even they would say, okay, you know, NATO was maybe, did, did do some good things, but now, you know, yeah, now we can see we need NATO because there's this big uh, Russian threat in the East. So um, even those, uh, yeah, cannot be critical now of NATO. Oh, uh, did, how do you how how would you respond to that? Well, yeah, I, I call NATO is a jobs program for a bunch of white guys. Okay, it's just it's an anachronism. It outlived its usefulness and should have been disbanded in 1991. But you know, let's look at what has transpired in NATO since 1991. It has grown in numbers. Well, why? Well, that's because. Uh, the United States and Great Britain alone didn't have enough soldiers to keep uh, to have the force level they thought they wanted. So the way you increase the force level is you keep bringing in new members. Now, uh, the, the the notion that NATO is there to defend against a Russian attack is that that's just the legacy of the Cold War. And, you know, even going back during the Cold War, um, I, I think the Soviet Union always was an excuse uh, for uh, we needed we needed a villain in order to justify you know multi billion dollar defense budgets. So NATO really has no purpose. But you, you know look at look at it from Russia's standpoint, or think of it uh, you've got a private home and your own private yard, mm -hmm. uh, and um, your neighbor continues to encroach on your territory and continues to do things that pose a threat to your territory. Well, that's what NATO has been doing to Russia. It's not Russia that's been re expanding its borders outward. It's been NATO that's been recruiting members on the border of Russia. Hmm. And then on top of it, conducting military exercises. You know, there's a there's a base in Western Ukraine called Yavariv. Uh, that base was hit with a, with a caliber missile, I believe, uh, in March of 2022. In the very beginning. Uh, it, it, yeah. yeah, it was, it was devastating uh, to, uh, and surprising. Cause I know, I know what I heard from the reaction of the United States in terms of uh, the joint staff, the department of defense, they were shocked. They had no idea that this was coming in. You know, it caught them completely unawares. And it killed a bunch of foreigners who were being assembled there. Well, that, that base, Yavariv, had been used previously with NATO uh, in uh, some a variety of exercises and training. There was one uh, post up on the internet where they described that they were doing cyber uh, security training, but they described it also as they were teaching the Ukrainians to do offensive cyber operations. Mm -hmm. So this whole notion that NATO was, oh, we're a defensive organization, nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, every year after 2014, NATO and the U.S. European Command conducted an exercise with Ukraine, oftentimes in Ukraine on Ukrainian territory or in the Black Sea. And, you know, I, I know how the United States would react if Russia was conducting such operations with Mexico or with Canada on the border of the United States. We would be outraged. We would view it as a direct threat. And yet we think that we can get away with doing this to, to Russia and they won't react. So that, that's why I view NATO has been a provocation all along the it, it, it's been it's been an excuse to stay in conflict with R Russia, formerly the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. in order to justify really massive defense spending. And your analysis is that 
basically it is all about money in the end. Yes, I mean, yes, yeah. yes. So all war is money. a racket, Smettler Butley. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it is. It's really such a disconnect because if you, if you go back and look, you can't. In, in 1991, when the Soviet Union broke up, at that point, NATO should have said, "Okay, our uh, our reason for existence, our reason for being, has has gone away. So let's let's work on how do we rebuild a, a relationship in Europe with this new Russia." Mm-hmm. Well, that wasn't done, and then the United States, instead of reducing its defense budget continued to expand it. We kept we we needed to look and find an enemy. Within then we found terrorism. And oh boy, terrorism! We can, uh, of course, during the 1990s, the excuse was we have to build up the Department of the Defense with a missile defense shield. Uh, so we need Star Wars, uh, and so that was the justification then. And then 9/11 happened, and it t- the total shift in the U.S. Uh, defense budget and, and, and really an explosion of contractors who were then making money off of the U.S. government. And the the problem with Washington, I, I don't know how it is in in the Netherlands, but uh, these the the lobbyists who the, their job is to gather up corporate money, pass it to members of Congress, and then those members of Congress in turn will vote for those corporate interests. Uh, it's a it's a nice cozy circle, and you know that's that's unfortunately I think what has been driving a lot of this. I think it's uh, it's not that obvious in the Netherlands, it's not that uh, visible, but I think I, I recently read some obituaries for uh, um, the lady that died from from uh, what is her name again? The uh, you need to help me. The 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 the, the is, is she a congressman? Oh, you mean uh, Senator Diane Feinstein? Yes, no, sorry, I, I just the name escaped me. Yeah, Diane yeah, Feinstein, yeah, yeah. and I, I, re- I read in some some of her obituaries that this is exactly what she often did, isn't she? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. They, I, I lived when I lived in Bethesda, Maryland. My next door neighbor was the lo- largest. He was uh, the president of the largest defense lobbying firm in DC, hmm. and uh, you know, I saw saw how it worked. His job, he he would host dinners, um, and he was he was out every night with uh, and and at these dinners, uh, there was a member of Congress, uh, you know, either a, from the House of Representatives or a Senate candidate. They'd show up, and you know, they'd do a talk, and there'd be other people that would be invited, and they would show up with a check in hand, and uh, then he was, you know, he worked for I know Raytheon, General Dynamics. Uh, Lockheed Martin had them all, and so I have the, trouble, the money you know, the money goes from there to the to the members of Congress. Hmm. Now we 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 know we hear we've heard this story yeah, that of course people are talking of the military industrial complex etc. Mm-hmm. and the evils of it and people understand it. Um, at the same time, I know people who study at the military academy here in the Netherlands, and they they generally. They they have a they have a, a real sort of how I, I would say <clears throat> ideological courses on how the the NATO is about protecting freedom and democracy. Yeah, and, <laughs> and be, yeah you, you laugh about it, yeah. but gen, yeah. generals actually yeah. teach there. Who, yeah. I, in my my perspective, my view is that they actually believe it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they, it's... So where where is this dividing line? Because we can talk all very cynically about it, and we can see through it and the money schemes behind it, but there seems to be also something genuinely ideological behind it, no? And and where is this mix? Who who believes that story about freedom and democracy, and who is just there for the money? Oh yeah, let me get. It's almost the the entire West has been, I guess, uh, saturated with a meme. With a uh, with an ideological position that is really, I think, not historically accurate. Example: uh, We the the Soviet Union was frequently described as a Bolshevik revolution, right? Mm-hmm. The Bolsheviks were in charge. Yes. Well, who was who was the leading Bolshevik? Well, mm-hmm. there was a guy named Leon Trotsky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, what happened to Trotsky? Well, he was he, he was uh, assassinated, 
Stalin mm-hmm. had him killed. So you have the leading Bolshevik killed by Stalin. Well, what was the issue between them? Well, Trotsky believed in global revolution. He believed that it was that the, the communism should be spread around the world. Stalin didn't believe that. Yet, the way the, the United States and Europe has conceptualized the Soviet Union, even under Stalin, is that the they were intent on a global revolution. Mm-hmm. So there, there's the first example where just the history of that was uh, was false. Mm-hmm. That you know Stalin was concentrated on trying to uh, drag uh, what was then the Soviet republics out of uh, you know years of poverty and, and neglect. Mm-hmm. And because uh, under under the rule of the czars, you still had a largely uh, uneducated population and, and extremely poor. And there's a, there is a reason that the word slave that in English comes from the Slav. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a, a culture that originates the concept of Slav, uh, you've got to, you got to step back and take a look. So if, and if, if we did that in order. So now we have this enemy, the Soviet union must be crushed. And yet in the very beginnings of that of the Russian Revolution, you had invasions by the Americans, by the Brits, by the French. And so just repeating what had gone on the previous 200 years. Hmm. So the Russians had always had a sort of a fear of the outsiders, and yet they wanted to be part of Europe. Hmm. And so they were trying to figure out how to bridge that gap. And um you know, the the efforts uh, that Stalin took in the immediate aftermath of World War II to consolidate control in Eastern Europe. Again, I uh, I don't excuse it, but I understand it as far as creating a buffer. Mm-hmm. So it, it's just we, we've had this this um, war fever built into our DNA in the West. Mm-hmm. And we've always got to have an enemy. And it doesn't matter. We're not. We have no incentives that drive us to look for peaceful re- resolution. Mm. Yes, um, <laughs> but, but my, I'm, I'm I'm still sort of astonished by the fact that sort of high level generals can actually believe then the sort of the more the the moral support superiority story. The you know the 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 garden mm-hmm. versus uh, the jungle story and the yeah yeah. You know, some guy actually told me. Uh, from the military academy, that actually we fight wars the West less brutally than the Russians do, and he was—I mean, it, it was part of his course. You know, we we are more. I mean, when yep. we fight, it's for. Yeah. Did, did you ask him, what's the last war you fought? Yeah. Hasn't, yeah, you know. He, I mean, the, not to disparage the Dutch, mm-hmm. but I mean, you guys have a nothing. You're nothing as far as you as a military force goes. Okay. You're great people. You got some really big people, I know. I mean, the Dutch, I had some good friends down in uh, Central America who uh, came out of uh, the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. But, but you know, uh, we got police forces in the United States bigger than the Dutch Army, okay? <laughs> I think the, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, I mean, and, oh, we fought. Where did you fight? I mean, mm-hmm. the same with the United States. Mm-hmm. You look at these generals like Petraeus or Ben Hodges. And they're they're all talking about the Russians this and the Russians that. These are guys that didn't win a single war. Mm-hmm. I mean, we invaded, uh, we we went into Afghanistan in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks mm-hmm. uh, and failed, like every other colonial power in the past, failed to defeat the Taliban, the Mujahideen, the Afghan people. Failed. Mm-hmm. After 20 years, they drove us out. We mm-hmm. spent over a trillion dollars and it got driven out. Uh, so th- those guys are touting all oh, our victory. The, the the fact of the matter is mm-hmm. nobody in the West, mm-hmm. uh, with the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy, the, the, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, nobody has fought a peer mm-hmm. uh, by that uh, somebody who's of equal stature on the, on, on the fields of battle since the since really the end of uh, World War II, yes. So the, what what I mean by that is, whatever Dutch soldiers mm-hmm. were deployed to either Afghanistan or to Iraq as part of NATO, they weren't facing artillery fire by guerrillas. 
They weren't facing bombing, getting strafed or bombed by fixed wing aircraft because the guerrillas didn't have that. You know, they had some mortars and they had some machine guns and some rifles. So it's like enough with this mythologizing that has gone on. It's really ridiculous. Yeah. So, um, but what I then in that case don't understand is that, so if you say at the root of this is people making money. Mm -hmm. uh, industries lobbying for more more weapons and these wars are very very beneficial for all those industries isn't it yeah then what i what i see is that there and i don't know if you agree with it besides the money thing i think there is sort of an ideological aspect to it because now when you when you looked at ukraine and i'd like to hear your opinion on, on the current state of affairs but you I, I think we can already say that it doesn't look very good for ukraine and actually, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> that's an understatement. So, yeah. but we we keep sending weapons and we we keep escalating. But out of a simple money perspective, this is this is not really a win situation, isn't it? Because their weapons are burning, we are actually losing. So, is when does reality kick in? For me, the the the, the drive to continue, if, even in these desperate situations, points also to some sort of ideological aspects. We have to sort of be the superior we have to be the the the, the protector of this uh, this uh, attacked country or something or, or don't, don't don't you see some like ideological reasons why we are we are I, I've, I've been surprised really about the the, the length we are prepared to go in order yeah. to sort of protect ukraine well i i, I must say i'm i'll share i'm shocked that the europeans have been acting like lapdogs of the united states yeah, uh, I mean, I, I really, uh, in the past, I experienced more sort of when I was with the U.S. State Department, I was involved with uh, some co international conferences like the European Civil Aviation uh, Conference, ECAC, mm -hmm. and uh, interacted with the Germans and, and the French and, and the Dutch. And, you know, 30 years ago, they were, I, uh, I think, a tad more independent, less Less likely to be submissive to the United States, yeah. but that that's changed. Uh, you don't you, you you you. It is rare to see a European nation speak out against in opposition to what the United States has been advocating. You know, you're getting that a little bit with Viktor Orban in in, in Hungary, and he's being attacked. He of gets course. attacked as being a being a fascist and a right winger, uh, and now you've got. Uh, the, Same goes for Slovakia. Yeah. Yeah. So with Slovakia, just uh, with their election, it remains to be seen. Yeah. But uh, if the if the party that won the you know had the most votes is uh, secures the ability to put a, put together a government, then that's two voices. But yeah. where's the rest? The yeah. the rest are this uh, have aligned themselves with this uni, uniparty or the yeah. unilateral the one world order. It's the United States. They talk about international uh, rules-based order. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just the United States makes the rules and we get to control it. But, and But why do you think we are so... Why, why do you think it has changed for the worse in Europe? Like the, the way we followed uh, the US? Like why is there no... in the, At least Western Europe, is there less criticism than before? I, I, I don't know. There's It, it puzzles me. You know, part part of what we've seen emerge over the last, you know, six, seven years is this, uh, let's call it this globalist vision that has been reflected in the World Economic Forum and the likes of Klaus Kla uh, Kla Schwab. Schwab. Uh, and, and, you know, this it, it's all sort of welded together, this, the, the increasing demand of LGBTQ rights. Yeah, that's become a focus. Climate change. Uh, you know, don't get me started on that. With the, you, you know, the the very phrase, climate change. Well, <laughs> climate's dynamic. It does change. Mm -hmm. Historical record shows we've had ice ages. We've had warm. You know, mm -hmm. but without getting that debate, the, those two be, have become an international phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then it's it's really almost a rejection of science. Yeah. Science uh, in terms of biology, science uh, uh, in terms of physics, that, that has been a rejection. And it's been the West has rushed towards this. Well, uh, and, and it sort of as a counterpoint to that, a, a place like Russia has pushed back. 
Mm. They said, no, you know, we're, we're not, we're not going along with that agenda. Mm. Uh, they, they've, they've maintained sort of the, the national identity. Yeah. And I think one of the things you've lost is uh, the national identity in dis- different countries has been submerged under these uh, international organizations. Yeah. And that's, that has been accelerating, I think, over the last two or three years. So the yeah. ideology of it is that uh, you can uh, try to cancel out anybody that does not embrace that vision. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, we call it woke, being woke in the United States. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, you know, it's it runs up against reality. Though. That's the thing. That's the thing I think what you're grappling with, yeah. because you get all these general... <clears throat> You look at the number of officers mm-hmm. and people and senior generals. You've got more right now, I would venture to say, in the in the Dutch Army than you had at the end of World War II. What? Well, I mean, again, the Dutch were fighting uh, as underground resistance, but mm-hmm. what was set up in the immediate aftermath was mm-hmm. still smaller than what you have now. Mm-hmm. And you got, I would argue, you have less of a threat. Same in the United States. Mm-hmm. We've we've had. I think Doug McGregor has pointed out there's something like 40 uh, four-star generals yeah. uh, within the U.S. military and the Army, Navy, Marine Corps. Well, in World War II, we had four or five, yeah. <laughs> and we had millions yeah, more people, on the arms. Yeah. people under under command. So it's just, yeah. like I said, it's a, it's become a jobs program. Yeah. Yeah, and what scares me in the in the West, or at least in the Netherlands, is that you talk about. I ask about the the leadership of Europe and why they're so slavishly following one thing. It's also, you know, they have that's a very clear line of who belongs to the group and who doesn't. And mm-hmm. it's it's very scary to me that apparently being against war, you are not part of the group now. Yeah, you are. And, well. and, yeah, and uh, it, it even in the especially maybe on the left side of the spectrum, uh, you you talk about LGBT and climate. That has become sort of the the the, the dogma of the left, let's say. Yeah. And yeah. everything outside, like traditional left wing values, like co- uh, countering poverty or more equality or anti discrimination or anti war, anti war, it's all absent from the agendas. Yeah. We we yeah, cannot yeah. vote. Uh, we and the, the 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 weird thing is also that that agenda is being sort of now taken over by what we then call radical right. They are suddenly taking over. They're certainly the most anti-war at the moment. It's yeah. it's it's a bizarre time for me. No, it really, it really is. It's yeah. well, I, I don't you know when you, I don't know what your experience was in high school, but I suspect this is universal. Mm. When you're in high school, when you're in the that uh, when you're between the ages of fourteen and seventeen yeah. and going to school, in those school situations, there's always the tendency to form cliques, yes. groups of groups of favored groups and those who are sort of the outsiders. Yeah. And what we find is, you know, international politics is just a continuation of high school, except they have actual real guns or more yeah. guns than what you had in high school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And let me go to some actual, uh, the, the actuality, the, the current affairs in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you talk about it almost daily. Um, how do you what are the chances now for ukraine what are the what are the odds how 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 is it uh, because let's say in the west uh i think ben wallace published an article yesterday or today uh, in his I new see, job yeah. saying uh you know we can still ukraine can win etc you just have to continue etc <laughs> it's yeah, still uh, the mantra yeah it's, it's delusional um without financial support from the United States principally and from some of the other NATO countries, the ones who can afford it, uh, the United Kingdom, France, uh, Germany, uh, Ukraine would be, the, the war would stop. It would stop within a week or two. They would have no means to continue it, number one. So I, I hear these people talk about, oh, we're looking at a long war. Yes, it's going to be yes. drawn out. It's going to be a long war. No, it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's only going to be a long war if Ukraine wins the lottery and pockets, you know, two trillion dollars and then it can fund itself over the next how many years. But they don't have that. Uh, so, number one, there's the financial part of it. Number two, the, the, the manpower side. Ukraine, when this war started, NATO used Ukraine 
and viewed Ukraine as the de facto member of NATO. It wasn't legally a member, but for all intent and purpose, it was a de facto member. And NATO's army represented the second largest army in NATO after the United States, the third largest, Turkey. So when you take Ukraine, Turkey out of the equation, NATO is really, you know, a spent force. You know, it does, you know the uh, the British army can barely, they, they can't even scrape together 75,000 men. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they intended to use Ukraine as a battering ram against Russia because Russia was really viewed as weak, corrupt, uh, ready to topple. Uh, you know, I've used the image of the game Jenga, you know, that wood tower you build and you yes. pull out pieces. They thought that Russia was a Jenga tower and all we had to do was pull out a couple of pieces and it would crumble. Mm -hmm. Boy, were they wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so then they launched this, this war was launched and, and the West did everything in its power to provoke it, not to avoid it, but to provoke it. Mm -hmm. That included the United States deploying Aegis missiles in Romania and Poland mm -hmm. uh, last year that mm -hmm. represent a potential threat of a nuclear strike by the West. And Russia reacted. Mm -hmm. So when this war started, all of a sudden the the thought was the Ukrainian army is going to beat the Russians. Yes. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And now what has happened is Russia has decimated the Ukrainian army, the Ukrainian yes. military. Mm -hmm. It has it it has lost the equivalent of three arm three three armies, yeah. and it's now in the process. It's going to have to rebuild a fourth. But what's happened to the population? The the men who were most physically fit and most competent and best trained, they're dead or they're wounded. Yeah. And the casualties that Ukraine has suffered are massive. Mm -hmm. uh, estimated now over 500,000 dead. Think about that. In all of World War II, the British fighting in Europe, fighting in the Pacific, their total killed in action and the entire five years of that war for them was 345,000, okay? So Ukraine, in the, in the pace of 18, 19 months, has suffered, they're heading towards suffering double the casualties killed in action that the British suffered in all of World War II. So appreciate the scale of what is taking place. So Ukraine doesn't have the manpower. Uh, Russia has been very effective in destroying the air capability and air defense systems. Without fixed-wing aircraft, without air defense, Ukraine has no ability to pursue any kind of offensive operations, as has been demonstrated over the last four months, now entering the fifth month of their uh, you know, much ballyhooed counteroffensive that was going to push push to the uh, Sea of Az the Azov Sea. So the, the, Isn't it the, the, all known to the the Western, let's say, uh, protectors of Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, this, look, you don't have to have attended a military academy, or you don't have to have read uh, von Clausewitz, or be a student of Sun Tzu, to recognize tactically and strategically what's taking place in Ukraine. Ukraine yeah. has no path forward to victory it doesn't what what we risk is in the because nato recognizes that the defeat of ukraine will be a defeat of nato and it will raise fundamental questions throughout europe about why the hell are we even still part of this when we can't even you know stop russia hmm. not that they should be stopping russia but that it, it's gonna it, it'll lead to uh, I believe the eventual breakup of NATO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, strangely enough, I, I I see yet very few signs of that uh, in our own. If I talk about the Netherlands, people are not talking about it like that. Instead, they say no. Eh, what I said, like even anti-war politicians say, no. Okay, we have to deal with NATO because otherwise we would have been we would have been defenseless against uh, Russia. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what? Yeah, I mean. Yeah. It's, Again, get the historical evidence. Please show me where Russia invaded another country. Yeah. 
And there's a, you well, know what? Czechos, Czechoslovakia. The, yeah. Military intervention during the Soviet yeah. Union and Czechoslovakia and Hungary. Hungary but that yeah. was 40, 50 years ago. Oh. Since 1991, Russia has not been invading other countries. Just for waking up some morning and say, boy, I feel like conquering neighboring country. You know, <laughs> doesn't happen. Good accent. Now, what, what, what I... Um... One of the arguments that I hear the most, because I talk a lot with people about this in the Netherlands, and one of the things I hear most is the World War II argument about appeasement and about we shouldn't repeat the mistake of the Second World War, that we tried to appease Hitler, and first he wanted to date and launch, and then we just gave it to him in order to you know keep him quiet, and then we thought we, we, we would create another era of peace, and instead we created a monster, etc., this is, okay. I think, one of the main yeah. arguments that people use to say, yeah, we don't like it, but we have to be smart this time and prevent Putin from, you know, thinking that he can get away with this. So uh, where, where's uh, Putin's book, Mein Kampf? Mm -hmm. We don't have a Mein Kampf from Putin, never have. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've had is the Russians, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, they've made at least two attempts. Mm -hmm to join NATO. Mm. Putin came and said, hey, can we be part of your club? Mm. Now think about the logic of this. If we bring Russia into NATO, we no longer have to worry about Russia invading Europe because it's now part of the club. Yes. But what do they say? Hell no. Get away. Why? Because if you bring Russia in, the reason for NATO's existence goes away. Yeah, And look at it from Russia's side. Who, again, which countries in the world have been involved with more military operations outside of their borders? NATO and the United States. Yeah. Just ask the Serbians and the Bosnians. Just ask the Afghanis. Ask, look what's going on in Syria, Libya, mm. uh, Iraq. Mm. I mean, come on. Mm. You know, this... that. The people look in the mirror. Hmm. Stop talking about this imaginary threat that Russia poses. Or you know, the other one is China. Oh, yeah. we've yeah. got to stop those Chinese. What was the last country mm -hmm. that China launched a military operation in? Do you know? Um, it has to be somewhere in Southeast Asia somewhere, no? Yeah, 1979, yeah. Vietnam got into a war with Cambodia yeah. and China intervened on behalf of Cambodia and got beat by the yeah. Vietnamese, okay? Yeah. So we're now talking 44 years ago. Yeah. And since then, China's not been out with military, uh, you know, taking over other countries and dominating them. But again, that's the narrative in the West. We've got to stop the Chinese, yeah. And again, the one country that continues to expand its defense budget, right now the United States spends, I think the calculation is three times the defense budget of China and Russia combined, three times. Yeah. So if, you, if you're Chinese and Russians and you're looking out, who is the real threat in the world? Not them. Yeah. So... You know, we we use this, these false justifications that, oh, we, we got to stop the Russians and Chinese because, you know, those Russians are communists. Yeah. <laughs> they, haven't even, they haven't even caught up to the changes that have taken place in Russia, which mm. is now probably one of the most religious mm. nations in the world in terms of both Christianity and Islam. And Russia, you know, really, I think, is uh, mm. has become an example to follow. They figured out a way that uh, the Christian and Muslim populations lived together in peace after they went through that terrible 10 year of civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's, I, I see it as an example that ought to be emulated. Yeah. The world would be better off. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, um, I, I wonder, like, um, Ben Wallace has just published an article, as I was saying, you know, we must fight on something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, the UK has said we're going to train Ukrainian Ukrainians in Ukraine. We're going to bring <laughs> soldiers there, trainers, uh, and yeah. training camps there. Um, 
at what point do you think, um, like my, my question is all the time and it has been from the start, at what, how, how big is the risk of a real escalation and a real direct confrontation between Russia and the US or NATO? How big is no, that? that yeah, I, I think it's huge. Uh, now, the, the British have done a complete 180 or is a, uh, 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 what is that? Baerbock, is she the, def uh, the yeah. foreign yeah. minister or defense minister in Germany? And she calls it a 360. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so the, the Brits have done a 180 or a complete reversal now that, oh, no, 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 we're not going to send any advisors and we're not going to do that. And that that's for down the road later. Yeah. But um, it's still what's happening is the United States and NATO are flying uh, with uh, fixed wing aircraft and drones, what they call ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance missions mm -hmm. in the Black Sea and up north. And then those missions are being used, it appears, as providing intelligence to Ukraine yes. that Ukraine is turning around and using to attack Russia. So one of these days, uh, I suspect uh, Russia is going to shoot some of those aircraft down. I, I candidly, uh, uh, I would have done it a long time ago, particularly the, the drones. You know, you're not going to kill any pilots, but you're going to send a clear message. Don't don't send your drones here anymore. This is now, I think, not welcome. Now I think uh, Douglas McGregor has made the argument that because actually Russia is super <clears throat> restrained, that actually that in the West that is being misunderstood as weakness. Yes. No, How do you exactly. think about that? Yeah, and that's that actually exactly raises right. the risk of escalation. Yeah, there's a there's a saying a saying in Spanish, se confunde el bueno por el buen, buenudo, that you confuse being good with being a fool. And that's mm -hmm. what that's exactly what's taking place. Uh, the, the, the many uh, military leaders and foreign policy leaders in the West, they, they, they assume that Russia's failure to react uh, to this is, is, is uh, because they're weak, incapable. Mm -hmm. And that boy, when you start, uh, you know, I call it like when you get somebody, you're poking them in the chest with your finger and they don't hit you back. You say, ah, oh, that you know, they're they're afraid. Push over, push over. And they're just no, they don't want to kill you. <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna allow you to get away with that for a while. But you reach a point where you cross the line and they react. And and so, I think that's where we're headed. That so because uh, yeah, I I always think it's a, a risk to mention World War Three too often because it can also generate an, uh, its own di dynamic. You know that we're <clears> actually <throat> moving there and actually promoting that. Of course, I don't want that, but in your opinion, are is are we on course to that kind of scenario? Yes, yeah, I have uh, that. That's why I keep speaking out and writing as I do, uh, mm -hmm. trying to avoid that. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's now, talk. Up, let's you, talk about the, that. The people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the people in the Netherlands. You, uh, you understand at least, and you have memory, or at least from your grandparents. Yes. Of what when war comes to your homeland and what that means. Mm -hmm. The United States doesn't have that. Hmm. We don't have the only memory we have, and it's faded completely, is of the Civil War, hmm. uh, where we fought each other. But yeah. apart from that, we have not faced any kind of foreign invasion since the British left in 1812. So to conclude uh, <clears throat> our discussion, um, and thank you for the time that you give us. Sure. Um, what this is a, of course. I mean, it's it's it, I, when I whenever I find myself talking about the World War Three, it's so bizarre because it's so ridiculous. No, it's ridiculous right. to, to even talk about it, consider it. But it's as you just confirmed, it is, it is a potential, a real, real a potential reality. So, um, as ridiculous as it sounds, how can we prevent World War Three from happening? It, we, it's got to come from uh, political pressure from from people. You know, that, that's the bottom line. Uh, so you're seeing a movement in that direction with the vote that took place in Slovakia. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, you get one more voice is now going to be speaking out. Uh, this so-called unity in NATO has got this fracture. Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to only be through political pressure as, uh, and, I, and well, I guess I'm hoping that our salvation will be uh, if there's a, real economic impact this winter shortages mm -hmm. uh, uh lack of electricity lack of heating in europe mm -hmm. 
that the people will be so outraged over the economic suffering mm -hmm. that they'll put pressure on their government to deal with the problems at home instead of looking for a war with Russia. You know, right now, still Germany, I think Germany and Britain have been the most belligerent. Poland, mm -hmm. it's it's interesting what's going yes. on in Poland mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they have really shown some animus of late towards Ukraine. It would be less likely what to... What happened, do you think, there? Well, it's a whole combination of things. I mean, on, on the one hand, Ukrainians dumping grain, uh, yeah. the perception of Ukrainians dumping grain in Poland was uh, hurting Polish farmers. And that, from a political standpoint, with the upcoming election, that, that uh, resulted in a pushback. Uh, the Poles go suing, uh, taking a legal case to the World Trade Organization against Poland, that uh, you know irritated them. Uh, then the, this you know harboring these Nazis, you know I I had never understood why Poles so eagerly embraced Ukraine early on, when you know again I understand they're 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 angry at the former Soviet Union over the Katyn Forest massacre, but that was the Soviets and. Under both Yeltsin and then uh, uh, Putin, there's been, you know, admissions of guilt and apologies from Russia for that event. That mm -hmm. many say, boy, this is wrong, shouldn't have happened. You haven't seen that, though, from the ba the Bandera folks. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the 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 Ukrainians that were involved in, in the Volin massacre of over 100,000 Poles during World War II, uh, the participation of Ukrainians in, in Nazi SS divisions, the Galicia division, and involvement as guards at death camps in Poland. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Poles just sort of overlooked that. Now, now they're coming to recognize, uh, not so good. In fact, they, they've talked about trying to extradite this uh, elderly former SS member that appeared in uh, the Canadian parliament with Zelensky a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. There has been all sorts of weird alliances and weird statements. Of course, um, Zelensky himself is presented as he is a Jew from Jewish heritage, so he cannot be a Nazi, no? Yeah. But I was even I, but yeah. I was really shocked by a tweet. I don't know if it, if it was even real. I think it was by Blinken, stating. I think it was uh, yesterday, stating it was about Babi Yar, the the horrible yeah, killing yeah. of thirty thousand plus uh, Ukrainian Jewish people and and uh, former Soviet people. Actually, sort of, he's, he's himself Jewish, Blinken also. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, his, he was, his, fa his family comes out of Ukraine, okay? Even that. Yeah. So he was he made this tweet actually blaming the Russians who liberated Kiev, right. which was the Soviet Union, and which, so it were Soviet citizens that were murdered there. He was blaming right. the, 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 the Russians for sort yeah. of silencing this crime. Yeah, <laughs> and no. while being Jewish, like how desperate are you in your, in your struggle? Like, uh, it's it's really uh, it, it it was good that the X Twitter, like there was there was no one commenting positively on it. Like hundreds of yeah. comments was all negative, so people know it, but it's so absurd. It's so um, blatantly. Well, what yeah. what he was seizing on is if you if you go to the Holocaust Museum webpage, mm -hmm. and when they talk about Bobby R. They, they blamed the Soviets for dragging their feet and building a, a memorial uh, at Bobby Yar, at the site of Bobby Yar. And mm. it didn't happen until 1976. Yeah. And then the, the plaque and the, the whatever was established there at that monument uh, referred to the deaths of uh, describing them as civilians, didn't identify them as Jews. Mm -hmm. But as you correctly noted, yeah, a majority of the ones that were murdered there were were uh, Ukrainian Jews, mm -hmm. but there were also Ukrainian communists, mm -hmm. and there were also uh, Soviet soldiers. Mm -hmm. So it, it was not just yeah, you know, it was predominantly Jewish, and the Jews seized upon that as a as an example of the horror that they suffered uh, during World War II. But mm -hmm. to blame just just because. The Soviet Union, and this is the yeah. key point, the Soviet Union didn't do the right commemoration. What the hell does that have to do with modern day Russia? Yeah, and because, while at the while sponsoring financially, right. militarily, the guys who are very probably at least at least ideologically the the the, the hairs of the air the 
They took the heritage no. of exactly the guys who did it, you know, the yeah, Nazis. Yeah, no, exactly right. Exactly right. And that's I mean, so it's just, absurd about the thing. Yeah. No sense of irony. These guys have no concept of irony. No. <laughs> you know, no. they just, uh, they're embracing, um, uh, they're embracing Nazis mm. and the Nazi imagery. Uh, and and then pretending that it has nothing to do with the Nazis. Uh, it's just, <clears throat> it's unfathomable. It's, it's, uh, yeah. The final thoughts about, okay, how to end this. Um, you say political pressure uh, towards um, towards politicians who do this. We, we talked about Diane Feinstein as one of those, mm -hmm. like an example of someone, I think his uh, her husband was, was a military contractor. Um, these guys profit from war. Yeah. Um, how? Like, I was. I was wondering: Are these guys also aware that they're they are potentially tr triggering a nuclear a nuclear war, and do they care? No, because they. Uh, part of it, it goes back to that false belief we talked about earlier. They they genuinely believe that Russia is weak, that Putin is hanging on by a thread. He just needs to be pushed a little harder, and the Jenga tower will collapse. Uh, and there's no way that the the Russians would ever attack us in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that is foolish, mm -hmm. uh, and it is very short sighted. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think really our, our the Russians may save us from ourselves mm -hmm. because uh, you've seen a hardening of their rhetoric uh, over the last uh, two weeks mm -hmm. from both uh, the chief uh, chief of defense Shoigu. Yes. Uh, the 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 deputy, you know, sort of the the, the equivalent of the U.S. Vice President Medvedev, mm. uh, Lavrov, mm -hmm. and then uh, Volodin, who's the Speaker of the Duma. Mm -hmm. and they've all said basically the same thing, which is uh, this is going to end one of two ways: mm -hmm. either Ukraine is going to capitulate, which mm -hmm. means an unconditional surrender, mm -hmm. or it's going to cease to exist as a nation. Yes, there's no middle ground there. Hmm. And uh, the only thing the West could do to try to stop that, and I don't think they can stop it, mm -hmm. would be to intervene militarily. And if they intervene militarily, then targets throughout Europe and the United States will be on the table. So people really need to step back and think this through. Okay, then a very final question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've had a lot of last questions already. We, on the 22nd of November, we have parliamentary elections in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And we organize a, a debate also with some parliamentarians who are, there's only a nuanced difference between them, but nevertheless, if I would, if you would be in front of our parliament, I know we are a very minor player. We are maybe nothing on the, on the, on the whole game of things. But if you would be in front of parliament, what would you give as a message to parliamentarians in the Netherlands? Um, look at Russia and put yourself in their shoes and look at how Russia has transformed over the last 23 years under Putin. Uh, instead of, uh, until this special military operation started, Russia was on a path of developing its own country, building new airports, subways, public spaces, businesses, improving the lives of their people. And that, I think, is the obligation of every government. What are you doing to make the lives of your people better? And by better, what do I mean? That they have more money, that they have more financial security, that they have better education, that they have lower crime, that they have... Uh, the, the kinds of cultural experiences that enrich the soul. And so sit down and look and say, are we doing that? Or are we spending our money and trying to build up our military and carry out uh, operations against another country? Uh, that will lead to poverty. Uh, I think, uh, you know, th there's a foundation here of comma, of a, a, a bond that can be shared between Russia and the people of the West. Uh, the Russians are not some foreign species. And without Russia or the Soviet Union, Europe would still be under the, probably the rule of the Nazis. 
because the fact of the matter is the United States and the United Kingdom would not have been able to defeat Germany, did not have the power. It was, it was the Soviet Union that made that happen. It was the Russian people who made that kind of sacrifice. All right. Uh, Larry Johnson, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very enlightening uh, interview. It was um, yeah, very pleasant to, to talk to you and hear your analysis and your views from across the ocean. Yeah. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, our parliament, I will send it to some parliamentarians and see uh, okay. how they react. Thank you very Good. much and hope to talk Thanks. to you uh, someday again. All right, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Good day.